Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the University of York. Today's event is part of our online wellbeing lecture series. Although in a different format, through our open lectures, we continue to aim to enhance York's reputation as a city of ideas and innovation through offering the highest caliber of public events. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the interesting talk this evening. Just a few technical notes to start. If you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button on your screen. I'll, I'll collate these at the end of the talk, but the Q&A function is available throughout, so do ask questions at any time. If you have any technical issues like a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin using the original link. Please remember that today's event is being recorded and you'll be able to watch again on YouTube in a few days time. You might notice this week that there are subtitles running at the bottom of your screen. If you'd prefer not to see this, just click on live transcript bottom right of, of the Zoom um, bar and you can hide these. If you're on Twitter, please do use the hashtag York Ideas to join in the conversation. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Ian Hamilton. Ian's a great colleague of, of mine in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York. He's a lecturer and researcher. He's also a registered mental health nurse who has over 20 years experience of working with people who have drug and alcohol problems. Ian writes a regular column for the, for the Independent. And he's going to talk to us this evening on the subject, no drugs. Over to you, Ian. Many thanks, Karen, and thanks also to the events team for uh, putting this on. Um, I'm very grateful to them for offering technical support, which um, I don't think I could manage. Anyway, I thought I'd um, look at knowing drugs. So what do we actually know about drugs? And really the aim for this session is to take an overview really of what we do know and what we interestingly don't know because what we don't know about a particular topic or subject is probably just as critical as what we do know. So th this slide, um, apart from showing a picture of Nancy Reagan, also has my um, Twitter handle on it, if anyone wants to get in touch um, via Twitter. Um, but the reason for, for titling the talk this way was it reminded me of uh, Nancy Reagan, who was the first lady um, to Ronald Reagan, President of America at the time, who really got behind a campaign to try and reduce what they called youth drug use in America, which they saw as a problem at the time. And the strategy they had and the way they organised this was via a kind of school education campaign, which really was centred on nothing more elaborate than trying to encourage children just to say no to drugs when they were offered them, a very kind of simplistic and as it happens, ineffective campaign. Um, and that's just one of many campaigns that I, I might just come back to as we go through this talk. So um, saying no to drugs is probably the least effective way of uh, reducing school children's uh, use of drugs. And in fact, in this particular example, um, follow-up research showed that it actually raised curiosity in school children who otherwise might not have been interested in drugs at all. So it was actually um, worse than uh, the stated aim of trying to reduce drug use. So, so these are kind of some of the headings that I'll briefly go through. That's the other thing, sorry, I should have said from the beginning is I'm not intending on talking for too long, but rather just to uh, give a brief run through of some of the main points about our understanding around drugs and addiction in particular, so that we can leave plenty of time for your questions and discussion at the end. So I was saying, you know, who's missing from our understanding uh, around uh, drug use? Now, one of the key groups, interestingly, talking from a university that we know very little about is students. And of course, um, that really matters because we, one thing we do know is that in terms of total numbers, it tends to be younger people who use drugs in the main, although drug use uh, happens at any age. But in terms of just the, the largest group, it tends to be young people. So frequently survey data um, and more widely knowledge is missing around this population, which is quite critical. I want to then look at uh, some of the problems we have in doing research, some of the problems with 
policy and particularly the war on drugs, briefly look at alcohol and then talk about women in particular um, and some of the issues there are around drug use and women are understanding. And then finally to look at uh, two particular areas, one is dual diagnosis and I'll explain about that when we get to it. Um, and lastly, uh, around race and ethnicity and how particular um, groups are impacted by drug use there. So the first thing to um, look at is really how we get our information around drugs. And it's, it's really important to, I think, just reflect on that for a moment because drug use um, tends to be something that most people have a view on um, and it's how that view is formed, including my own. And on the left-hand side, you can see the, the image there of someone holding a poster so, yeah, talking about the war on drugs being a war on them. And the war on drugs goes back to, again, another American president, uh, President Nixon, who decided that he was going to put billions of uh, US dollars into fighting drug cartels, drug use, uh, drug dealers uh, generally in America. And that, that's something that has continued to this day. The war on drugs continues both in America and across most of the Western world. There are international treaties around drug use. Um, and it's the way those are interpreted and employed uh, that you see this kind of uh, summary known as the war on drugs. We can see that in really what's happening in contemporary uh, events across the world. So uh, President Duarte in the Philippines has really been quite brutal around his approach to drug use in the population um, and has ordered people who use drugs are found to be using drugs or even just sometimes on hearsay um, to be executed. Uh, so a really brutal way of interpreting uh, drug policy and implementing it in uh, that country. But it's not just about policy. I think the, the other way we uh, rely on information is through evidence and research. And it's important to point out that the largest organization um, in terms of um, income and also reach is again, the American institution known as the American, uh, sorry, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, so they, uh, take federal money and conduct um, a range of research projects. But it has to be said, over the years and right up to now, that has had a very uh, biological focus uh, to it. So, you know, they're interested in using MRI scans to see which kind of uh, parts of the brain light up when you use cocaine and so on. It's that type of research. And, and clearly some of that is important, but it's also important to understand that because of the uh, dominance of their, um, I, I guess, income and their publication output, that we actually have some skewing in terms of our understanding around drug use and problems that develop as a result that tend to be quite biologically focused rather than on social aspects or environmental aspects. But of course, um, the, the other implication or the, the other thing that rolls out of um, really, you know, the war on drugs and in the UK, um, some of the propaganda that we, we see around drug use is, is not untypical. So this poster here actually goes back about 100 years um, and um, is also trying to put people off using cannabis or marijuana, as they call it. Um, quite an elaborate poster, which um, makes all sorts of claims around uh, what will happen to people if they use drugs. So, um, Apparently, you could get involved in weird orgies, wild parties. Um, you'll end up committing crime, uh, have a miserable time, um, so on and so forth. So it may look uh, slightly um, comical now, but of course, those type of campaigns have continued up to this day, and they may look a little bit more sophisticated, but quite often they're not balanced. They, they tend to, again, focus on the negative aspects of drug use and even then use questionable evidence uh, when portraying particular drug use, whether it's cannabis um, or other illicit drugs. So all I'm trying to say really is we have a long history um, of getting information through a particular lens, whether that be through a particular research lens, a particular policy lens, so it can be quite difficult to see through all the noise of that and try and get good factual based information and that's a particular problem 
uh, when we think about young people and um, if when they are curious about drugs, where do they go to get that information? Um, so we've seen examples in this country recently, uh, certainly over the last two years, with novel psychoactive substances, and in particular, um, novel uh, psychoactive forms of cannabis, which aren't actually natural cannabis, but uh, synthetic forms. And we, we've seen, you know, news pictures of people who are homeless, um, very visibly um, under the influence of some of these drugs. And these drugs have then been tagged in the media as zombie drugs, um, rather um, bluntly and, um, you know, quite often attributing things to these drugs, which uh, are just not true. You know, people developing super strength, uh, superhuman powers, uh, so on and so forth, which um, are far from the truth. Now, credibility around information, particularly when it's coming from official bodies, really matters. And if we think what's happening with COVID and, you know, people's reliance on uh, government agencies for information and their levels of trust in that, clearly it's not just limited to COVID. But if we have young people who are mistrustful of government information around drugs, then that kind of implications for uh, the way they might approach other public health concerns, including COVID later on in life. So I think getting this right, getting clear, credible information around drugs um, should be a priority for the government. Just, just to spend a minute talking about alcohol, uh, it's quite interesting because I, myself included, we quite often see um, the expression alcohol and drugs as though alcohol wasn't a drug <clears throat> or was somehow distinct. Um, and of course, alcohol is a chemical. It is a drug. It's a psychoactive drug in the same way cocaine is. Uh, heroin is or cannabis but of course alcohol um, is regulated in this country it's not legalized but it's regulated uh, so you know not everyone can use it for example um, you know if you're under 16 you can't go into shop and buy it uh, although uh, from a very early age it can be given to you in, in the home so we have a very kind of um, almost cozy relationship with alcohol I think as a nation you know it's use of alcohol has become very normalized um, and the, the other thing I just want to highlight is the way that the industry influences policy. So the alcohol industry is very, um, I think, adept at um, lobbying this government, uh, lobbying governments across the Western world um, to ensure that policy works in its favour, whether that's around taxation, uh, around access. We've seen examples of that in COVID where very early on in the first wave of the pandemic, uh, the industry lobbied very effectively to ensure that off licenses were deemed essential services so that people could continue um, purchasing alcohol via off licenses. Again, just very briefly, one of the things that's become clear during uh, this COVID pandemic is we've seen three groups of people impacted um, or the relationship around alcohol uh, develop in three distinct ways for the population. So first of all, we have those who were drinking at very low levels or were abstinent prior to COVID, and they've more or less continued uh, to do that. So they've either continued with being abstinent or drunk at low levels. There's an, another third, uh, another group who are drinking at moderate levels. Um, so drinking roughly around the recommended uh, number of units a week, which is 14 for men and women. Um, and they've more or less stuck to that. There might be some deviation up and down, but they're not drinking at risky levels. But the third group is the group that really concerns me. They, they were drinking at high levels prior to COVID. And the two or three surveys that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic show they're drinking uh, at elevated rates, even above um, the amount they were drinking since COVID started. And the, the reason that's concerning is I think we've got a problem with support for that group. Uh, during COVID, which I'll come back to in a little while. There are many myths around alcohol as well. And the first one I want to murder, or because uh, we have a lot of time, the only one I'll murder around alcohol is this idea that alcohol helps you sleep. And of course, the only thing alcohol helps you uh, do is become unconscious. Uh, alcohol does nothing for sleep and in, in fact makes sleep poor. And it's one of the first things that people notice when they do campaigns or participate in campaigns like Dry January is actually the sleep improves, the quality of sleep improves. So the question is <clears throat> whether it's alcohol, whether it's cocaine, whether it's heroin, is 
addiction a random event um, or is it something that we can be a bit more precise about now what's interesting around drug use is we broadly have two groups of people we have people who are able to function while using drugs so it, it could be someone like me who's using opiates every day but you know i continue to do things like this and do other aspects of my job um, which i can carry on doing um, you know ad infinitum but then there seems to be another group of people who their drug use compromises their basic functioning. So whether that be uh, interrupts their thinking process, uh, disrupts their relationships, um, means they can't hold down a job um, and they are very preoccupied by their drug use um, and referred to as dysfunctional drug use. Now, interestingly, one example of how um, we need to challenge some of the kind of perceived wisdom around uh, certain drugs is uh, I would use the example of what happened in the Vietnam War where soldiers in Vietnam um, many of them started using opiates no doubt to cope with um, what they were seeing and what they were engaged in but interesting when those um, uh, soldiers returned to the US um, few of them continued using opiates and didn't seem to experience um, withdrawal symptoms that we would usually see um, in people who've become dependent physically and psychologically on opiates. So this was one of the first studies back in the early 1970s that challenged, as I say, this idea that um, opiates were addictive for everyone. All you had to do was take them for a couple of weeks and you would become addictive and unable to stop use um, Otherwise, it would be very uncomfortable or you would relapse. So I, I think what we really need to um, look at is what happens on the journey from pleasure, as it were, to pain. You know, in perhaps pleasure, the best way of framing this, but these soldiers were certainly looking to relieve the psychological and perhaps physical pain they were experiencing by turning to drugs. So this idea of self-medicating. Um, and I think if we could understand more about the beginning of that, the pleasure part of drug use it would also help us understand more about what happens on that journey from pleasure to pain and perhaps help those who develop problems um, one person I, I think is worth mentioning with this to just kind of help uh, reset the balance that NIDA um, so effectively have, have set us on in terms of a biological understanding of uh, drug use and dependence is uh, Norman Zinberg who back in the early 80s I uh, wrote this book, which, as you can see, is called Drug, Set and Setting. And, and really what Zinberg was concerned with is that psychoactive drugs uh, vary in their effect. But what's also malleable and what seems to impact the experience is the mindset of people who are using them. So what frame of mind are you in prior to using the drug? Um, you know, are, are you feeling optimistic, hopeful, happy when you begin to use drugs or are you feeling the opposite way? But also the physical and social environment in which you use drugs also, he believes, uh, has an impact on the not only the effect that drugs will have on you, but whether you continue to use them or not. So I'd recommend looking at Zinberg's uh, work, although it's uh, now 30 years old, I think it's still as relevant today. I'm using it as one example uh, to get us thinking uh, around the environmental aspects and the social aspects of drug use. Yeah, I've already mentioned one group uh, who we know very little about, uh, students, interestingly, but the other group I, I just like to spend a couple of minutes on is women. And Broadly speaking, we know that twice as many men as women will use drugs, so particularly young men in their teens uh, compared to young teenage uh, women or girls. And we, we don't fully understand why that is. We, we've got some um, best guesses around um, young men's desire for risk and um, for experimentation, etc. But we still haven't really got to the bottom of that. And I, I want to just share with you how that's impacted research. So taking something very specific like um, cannabis psychosis, um, one of the first uh, seminal studies on looking at cannabis psych psychosis was conducted in Sweden by um, a group led by Sven Andreasen. And he 
um, really looked at a group of 50,000 uh, Swedish Scot conscripts to the Swedish army. And of course, those conscripts were all men. Um, and this seminal study set really researchers on the path for continuing to, I think, overly focus on men rather than women. So very briefly, uh, what I'm trying to say is our understanding about something as broad as addiction, but even specific like cannabis psychosis is still, still very skewed towards men. We know far more about uh, the problems men develop with cannabis, uh, like cannabis psychosis, than we do women. Um, and to me, that's a travesty because I think um, understanding how women are affected could also, uh, I think, help men and vice versa. One of the things we do know about women in addiction is they um, are subject to this uh, phenomenon known as telescoping. That's what the middle picture is meant to represent, in case you're curious. Um, and telescoping is this phenomenon where from first exposure to drug use to developing a problem like dependency happens in a shorter time, we think, for women than it does for men. And we don't know why that is. And that's a really important thing to unpick and unravel. Just one example of uh, several things we don't know about women. I'm glad to say um, there's now been um, an agreement amongst the uh, scientific journals um, to sign up to something called the SEGA guidelines, which impresses um, and encourages researchers to report uh, outcomes for men and women. So bizarrely, although researchers have been doing research which has included men and women, quite often that data isn't disaggregated by gender and that's slowly beginning to change. And that's a, a really specific example, but I think uh, one that illustrates quite well why we have a problem and why we, we don't understand as much as we should about uh, women addiction. I should say it doesn't just apply to uh, the field of addiction, it applies to all areas of health research. Now here's, here's again um, something very specific. This is looking at um, UK drug use um, compared with deaths and this is uh, for women. So you can see over the um, last few years deaths have been slowly um, increasing for women and uh, while drug use, um, although it's picked up in the last year or two, has broadly been on a downward trajectory. And all I really want to uh, get across with this slide is, al although you can see there are hundreds of women who are dying each year, uh, this is just is in England and Wales, we think this is um, a significant underestimate of the number of women who are dying. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is we think coroners are less likely to investigate uh, suspicious or adverse deaths among women rather than men. And obviously that leaves us with a, a less of an understanding and if you like, less of a head count, to put it um, quite brutally, around the number of women who are dying as a result of drug use. And that really matters because in order for a problem to be taken seriously, we need to be able to uh, provide accurate data and that would have an impact on policy as well, I think. Coming back specifically to understanding pleasure um, as a starting point um, on the journey through to pain, I think the reverse can also happen, um, as mentioned with the Vietnam uh, soldiers. We also know that um, many people are introduced to, for instance, opiates uh, via a prescription because they've had uh, surgery um, or a need of uh, pain relief or analgesia. Uh, so the, the, the kind of exposure to drugs, um, in particular like opiates or cocaine or um, anything else, um, isn't always through uh, seeking pleasure. It can be through uh, what's known as uh, the psychiatrogenic um, introduction where a doctor prescribes a particular um, a pill or potion uh, that has an opiate in it. And people soon, um, in addition to having their analgesia relieved, also like the effect uh, that they feel or feel uncomfortable when that um, prescription is reduced and then either accept that or go on to uh, try and source more of the drug. But of course, both pain and pleasure are quite subjective terms and that can make them very tricky to research, um, but it shouldn't stop us from doing it. 
and clearly for some people um this isn't a binary thing you know they, they're not uh, solely using drugs because of pain or for pleasure but both you know they may go through a um, an experience one day that um, is trying to mitigate pain by drug use and the next day uh, seeking pleasure but certainly understanding the pleasure of drug use rather than solely just the um, problems and pain associated with drug use I think is really key but when things do go wrong and I'm thinking now about um, treatment um, I, I, the best way I can summarize what happens in uh, the specialist drug treatment sector is, as far as we know, it seems to make really very little difference around the type of intervention that we offer. So whether that's something like cognitive behavioral therapy or some other type of talking therapy, uh, the actual therapy doesn't make a difference. But what really seems to make a difference is the therapist. So, you know, if we for example, therapist qualities that we would like to see, uh, what you want from a good therapist is someone who's warm, engaging, a good listener, uh, is non-judgmental. When all those qualities are, are optimized in a therapist, that's when we see better results um, in treatment. Um, now that may seem very obvious to you, but again, it's an area that's not been well researched. We seem to be drawn um, to new ideas and new therapies rather than looking at the basics and how we can enhance uh, those therapeutic skills in the workforce that we have. Just lastly, again, coming back to policy, just to leave you with this thought, we know that um, policy impacts different groups um, in differing ways. And, and perhaps in the UK and in the US, um, one of the really uh, problem uh, areas uh, is around the way policy is implemented and affects people from uh, BAME communities and particularly young black men, uh, certainly in the UK. So although um, roughly twice as many young white men use drugs compared to uh, young black men, um, we know that they are nine times, young black men are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched on uh, the basis or the suspicion of drug use. And, you know, I, I think drug policy um, in this country and in America um, couldn't be designed really in, in a worse way. And I, I'm by no means one that would advocate for a free for all when it comes to drugs. But I, I think we could do far better than we, we are currently doing with the broad war on drugs and the general um, idea of prohibition in this country. So, as I say, this is just one example of how drug policy in this country plays out and adversely affects uh, one group of our population. So, in summary, um, I think it's really important to stress that most people don't use drugs. And I think that's really important for young people to understand. I think many of them uh, believe that drug use is normal and they're the odd one out for not using drugs. So I think it's important to get that across to young people. Equally, I have to remember being a researcher and a clinician that actually, although I um, most of my um, career has been spent working with people who develop problems, the vast majority of people um, experience pleasure in relation to drug use. Unfortunately, in this country we have record drug related deaths and uh, I think that's um, partly as a result of drug policy in this country, so we need to change policy. Um, we are losing um, specialists in addiction treatment to the point that addiction psychiatry is almost extinct uh, due to budget cuts at a time when we have record drug related deaths. We also have um, the reduction and shrinking of drug treatment to try and support people with problems. Um, and that's probably because uh, many people in the population still view drug use and drug problems as a self-inflicted choice. So it's not a vote winner. I've mentioned uh, the last two points um, just at the end there. So this idea that it's the therapist rather than the intervention that matters and uh, the way that drug policy in this country disproportionately affects um, people from black and uh, minor minority ethnic groups. So I'm sorry this has been a quick sprint through, but I hope it's given you some food for thought and uh, some ideas of where we are in terms of uh, what we do know, and more importantly, what we don't know about drug use and drug problems in this country. Thank you. Thank you.
Ian, food for food for thought indeed, and um, and we've got lots of questions um, already. So um, apologies if we don't get through all of these in advance, but feel free to, to keep adding um, them to the Q and A box. Um, let's let's get started with a few, if that's if that's okay. So. Um, Actually, before we do that, can I just, I just realised that I didn't introduce myself at the beginning of the talk, so forgive me for that and let me introduce myself now before I, before I forget again. My name is Karen Bloor, I'm a Professor of Health Economics and Policy at the University of York and I'm the University's Research Champion for Health and Wellbeing. I apologise for not saying who I was at the front of the lecture. Anyway, back to the, back to the important stuff. Um, so we, the first few questions we had were all around mental health and drug use, um, and we've got we've got questions on both sides of that. So um, Mike asked about the detrimental effects on mental health of drug use and why that isn't better publicised. On the other side of that, Nikki asked about. In, in, in terms of what the mental health of drug users is and the reason they choose to, to use drugs um, and essentially why, why we're fighting um, this war on drugs, this war on people, as you, as you um, described it, with police and prison rather than, rather than helping um, them. And another, um, another attendee asked about the links between drugs and depression and suicide. So pick any of those okay, um, wow. areas, Ian, uh, um, <laughs> this, um, um, a few to choose from. Well, first of all, thank you for your questions, because um, otherwise we'd be stumped. Karen and I would just be chatting to each other at the moment. So uh, I appreciate you taking the time to think about this and offer some thoughts and questions. It, I, I think your first point around why, why don't we know, or I think it was something around why isn't there more attention, I think, publicly to mental health problems associated with drugs? And I, th I think that's probably a good point. Uh, it, it's difficult for me in some ways because, of course, it's what I spend all my time doing. So I think everybody knows about it. But um, that, that's an interesting perspective to hear. I, I think quite often what I do see in the news and the media and what I'm asked to comment on is extremes. Um, so it's when things go really badly wrong, you know, when there's been a homicide, um, and drugs have been involved. And it, to me, it's not always clear that actually drugs have been the trigger for a particular crime. It's just that someone is known to be a drug user or, um, I don't know, a test has been done and shown to be positive. So I think, again, we have to be quite careful in the way that we receive information. Um, and, you know, it makes for a good news story to have drugs involved. And for me, what's quite interesting is the way celebrities are dealt with by the media and homeless people and and they, they're treated in very different ways like i was saying about zombie drugs you know really derogatory terms used and footage quite frankly uh, that wouldn't be acceptable if people that were in you know that were housed or were celebrities and i'm not saying celebrities get a free pass but there is a kind of cachet around um if we think about and um, 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 I've forgotten, Ant and Deck, I've forgotten his surname, you know, and it was very public, wasn't he, or I don't know if he was public, but it certainly hit the news around his use of the drug tramadol and alcohol. Mm. Of course, because of his profile, there's quite a bit of sympathy and good wishes towards that. Um, but he clearly had, um, by his own admission, some mental health issues um, and was using, I think, um, the combination of drugs to try and you know feel better to mitigate that um, so I think we do occasionally see it in a kind of more ordinary way um, but I'd agree with you it's, it's maybe not treated as fairly as it should be in terms of why people use particular drugs that's a that's a cracking question so um, I think it's not accidental that we see people who have particular problems drawn towards using certain drugs the, the best way I can frame this for you is imagine if you were depressed if you um, felt really low. The way it stands, um, forget COVID, just even in, in normal times, you would go and see your GP, you would chat to your GP about it, and at best, you might be offered a prescription for an antidepressant. Unfortunately, that antidepressant is going to take three or four weeks to kick in, and even then it might not work. You must, might have to try another antidepressant. Mm. 
Well, again, don't get me wrong, I'm not condoning drug use, but if you found a drug that would work right here, right now, and it actually lifted your mood, why would you go through the palaver of an invasive conversation with your GP, getting the appointment, waiting for four weeks, putting up with the adverse effects, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in some ways, if, if we try and suspend our views about you know, what's right and wrong and around law and policy, in some ways, it's a no brainer. Um, you know, if you're looking for relief and depression, you know, is a terrible thing. It's, it's something that, you know, um, I think unless you've experienced it, you can't really appreciate how, um, how low it makes you feel um, and how desperate um, and lacking in hope. So anything that offers you relief, I can understand why people will, will do that. And again, just to stress, I'm not condoning uh, that people should use drugs, but I fully understand why they do. It offers immediate relief. There's no invasive questioning and assessment. There's no waiting lists or waiting periods. Um, it, it's, you know, um, very obvious when you look at it like that. Hmm. I don't know if that mops up. Yes, yes, I think so. Good um, okay, so there's a few, um, again, a few linked questions on, um, on legalization and on, on regulation. Um, so, one of our attendees, Tom, asked whether the um, growing decriminalization in some US states um, might, um, he, he phrased it as move the needle. I don't think a pun was intended, but um, <laughs> might this move the needle in, in a way that um, examples near a home like Portugal and Netherlands have not in terms of affecting UK policy? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the one of the difficulties with um, what's going on in America, well, not a difficulty, you could argue it's the largest natural experiment going on at the moment in terms of research. You know, they've, they've unleashed um, particularly cannabis on the population um, for recreational and medicinal use. I think it's now the majority of US states have um, permitted their populations to access cannabis. So it's a huge natural experiment. Uh, which I'm following with interest, but I think we won't really know the results of, uh, for instance, does it increase use um, amongst the, the particular population or even subgroups like young people? Um, what impact does it have on their health, physical and psychological? Well, the answer to those questions are probably five to 10 years away, um, despite some of the early papers that have been published claiming one thing or another. Um, so I, I, Wayne Hall, who's really the leading light on this, I, I follow his wisdom on this, that I think we are probably five to 10 years before we'll really know what the impact has been at a population level. Um, and of course, the, the regulatory models that have been introduced vary from state to state. So some use a taxation model um, to then fund uh, specialist drug treatment. Some just bank the coffers and, you know, let it swell the state's purse. Um, and, you know, even around things like potency, you know, put a cap on how strong your cannabis can, can be that you purchase um, and quantity as well. So all those things I think are really interesting. Whether, it's, whether that's had any effect on the UK, I'm not really sure. I mean, the, the biggest kind of surprise, I suppose, with UK policy in the last couple of years is the... Um, is around medicinal cannabis. So Sajid Javid, I think, trying to make his mark when he became Home Secretary, um, and also because of the very effective campaign that Charlotte Caldwell ran on behalf of her uh, son who had epilepsy, Billy Caldwell. And the media really got behind that. So I think Sajid Javid was cornered a little, but um, he opened up access to medicinal cannabis. What's really interesting is that actually less than 20 prescriptions for medicinal cannabis have been issued in the two years since um, the law was changed. So in some ways, it's a, it, it's a notional change in the law. The impact of it has been minimal. Mm. But of course, now you can get you know, CBD-infused coffee, uh, CBD-infused cat food. There's nothing that um, the derivatives of cannabis can't cure. Apparently so. <laughs> okay, so um, a, a related question on the um, politicisation of, of drug regulation in the UK. Um, and um, our questioner asks, 
whether we should give the advisory committee on the misuse of drugs more power. Um, so, because um, in, in, in this um, in this question is viewed, drug policy is politicised and decisions aren't evidence based. So, the example given here was cannabis being reclassified as Class B against the advice of the ACMD. So, should we give more power in policy making uh, to the advisory committee on the misuse of drugs rather than to politicians? I think that's that's a really well made point, and of course, yes, we you know we'd, and if we're to go with the current flow and um, ideas that the prime minister and the cabinet seem to have, is that they you know we're they're back in love with experts again, aren't they? You know they want to follow the science, um, mm -hmm. but of course um, they're quite selective in what they will and won't follow, and you know um, the evidence around drugs is a case in point. I think. Um, you know, the, in fairness, the, the ACMD, I think, provide the evidence. Um, so your point about should they have more power to, to make sure it's enacted? Um, I think that would be great. To my mind, what I've, so the, the position I've, or the thoughts I've developed around this is I've changed my mind. I think it's actually attitudes in the population that would make the biggest difference. So I think you can, you know, th there's a number of levers you can pull, isn't there? So the ACMD having more power, yes, that would be great. But of course, politicians, you know, they, they swim with the tide. It's very rare they act ahead of public opinion. Mm -hmm. So to my mind, it's public opinion that needs to change. And to go back to that example that I gave you earlier, I think there's still many people who view um, drug problems as self-inflicted choice. So therefore, people can get themselves out of it rather than understanding that many of those people um, are self-medicating or trying to deal with adverse events, um, whether that be trauma or, you know, um, some other factor in their life. Mm. Um, so I think if we could really see a shift in public opinion and attitudes, then I think politicians would have no choice. They'd have to listen to the ACMD. And of course, mm. listening is not enough. You need to act on it then, don't you, and follow the uh, implement what's being asked. So we, we're not short on evidence when it comes to what works, but we're, we're short on implementation. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Um, a student related one. Um, one of our um, attendees asks, um, New, Newcastle University Students Union apparently now offers accessible drug testing kits to students. Um, and would you like to see this rolled out by student unions across the country and should should we perhaps go further yeah well I've, this is of course where i've got to uh, make sure i um have an indemnity waiver here and say i'm not talking on behalf of the university i'm it's my personal opinion but yes of course i think anything that offers harm reduction you know you think about um what you what most of us might have done recently that's go and buy a bottle of wine or a bottle of beer imagine if that wine had no label on it so you had no idea other than it was wine, potentially, it might not be, but let's assume that it is wine. So you don't know what the ABV of it is, you don't know how strong it is, you, you don't know what the chemicals are in it, um, and that's what's going on with drugs. You know, the first time that you know there's a problem with drugs is when it's too late, you've ingested it and something's happened. So absolutely, and the policy shift in 2010 uh, from which the Conservative government um, kind of pivoted was one away from harm reduction to one of abstinence so again we go back to Nancy Reagan and just say no that, that's the you know childlike brutal ideological approach to drug policy in this country is you just have to say no mm -hmm. uh, so of course I you know I, I am really pleased to hear that Newcastle University are doing that I think it's important to stress on its own you know just testing drugs isn't a panacea you know you need to offer other things around that and I'm sure this whoever asked that question or is, is familiar with um, the situation will know that. Uh, that there needs to be some advice and counselling um, etc that goes along with that. But okay. great to hear it's happening. Yeah okay thanks. Um, so um, a different, different line of questioning um, more around um, sort of addictive personalities. Do you have any comments on whether people have a predisposition I mean, yeah, so this is something that I think um, 
quite a few people are curious about is, is whether, you know, you're almost destined to be using drugs and um, develop problems. So this idea of an addictive personality. And as I mentioned, there has been a lot of attention given to uh, genes and genetics and the kind of uh, biology of addiction because NIDA, um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the clue is in the title, by the way. Um, I mean, it's dreadful to think that in 2020, we have a government organization that has the word abuse in its title. I mean, that's you wouldn't find that with cancer um, or with heart disease, you know, that, that kind of loaded uh, language. Um, so I'm hoping they'll change that. But uh, anyway, more chance of that under Biden than Trump, I suspect. But anyway, um, so yeah, I, I, I think I think it's difficult, you know, the, for all the millions of dollars that have been spent on this, I'm not sure we're any wiser to understanding whether there is um, a true genetic link. And of course, well, what's really difficult is to separate out nurture. Um, you know, so the view I would have, <clears throat> excuse me, is it's probably nature via nurture. So, it, it, yes, of course, you know, there might well be something passed genetically, but that has to be triggered by something. And, and you know, there are very strong, I think, environmental triggers. So, for example, uh, learned behavior. If you see your parents use alcohol, um then you're more and also just having access in the house you're more likely to use it as a child and as a teenager um, and of course you have to use a drug in order for a problem to develop uh, if you don't use a drug you won't get a problem so um that route in um, if you think about things like the gateway theory you know this idea that if you start using cannabis you'll eventually um it's only a matter of time before you start injecting heroin there's, there's so many myths and misunderstandings um, and I, I don't, I wouldn't put it having an addictive personality in the myth category, but I think it is overemphasized. And also think about where it leads people. I mean, this idea that, you know, you're born to become um, an addict is pretty damning. Mm. Um, so I know I'm far more optimistic and hopeful. I, I think people, um, you know, do have the opportunity to make choices, but those choices have to be supported by you know, having resources around them, you know, good positive relationships, um, you know, and nurturing and, and loving um, house uh, and home to live in, etc. And sadly, all too many people don't have that. Hmm. So I think in short, if it's not clear, I think the environment's far more important than what you're born with. Okay, thank you. Um, on the treatment side now, um, so talk us through, um, what, how, how you think we can best treat drug addiction um, and rehabilitate um, people from, from addiction. Um, give, us a, give us a potted, um, a potted yeah. evidence base on, on the treatment of addiction, if that's, if that's at all yeah. possible. I'm sure, it's, I'm sure there's um, several PhDs worth in there, but um, yeah. if you can do that in 30 seconds, that'd be great. Well, I mean, as I mentioned, I think, you know, treatment has faced, the, the sector has faced brutal cuts um, and really perverse cuts, you know. The, so paradoxically, um, areas with the greatest deprivation in the UK are the areas that have experienced the sharpest cuts. I mean, it's bananas. It just doesn't make sense. Um, but it's also to do with the way that treatment is provided. You know, addiction psychiatry is a specialty. And... You know, if, if I go to, if I, God forbid, develop uh, cancer, I need to see a specialist. Um, you know, nurses are important, healthcare assistants are important, they make up part of the team. So, but to remove the most senior person from that team, I think is a value statement. And the fact that we've, you know, addiction psychiatry is now essentially an extinct species. Um, says a lot to me about um, how little we value people um, and invest in the recovery of people who do develop problems. So I think there's some very basic things, and yeah, I know it's boring, but you know we do need to spend money um, uh, on treatment, and you know it's not complicated. This, you know, this is one of the areas where thankfully we have the answers. This isn't about trying to find the answers. The answer is clear: spend money on treatment, but also. I think beyond specialist treatment, we know that people are offered uh, 
uh, for instance, suboptimal doses of substitute drugs. And that's because I think there's still a fear amongst many doctors um, around over-prescribing drugs like methadone or Subutex for people who are dependent on opiates. So we, we could do far better um, at not a lot of extra cost. Again, to do with attitudes, professional attitudes and beliefs, um, you know, that I, I think could make a significant difference to those people. Um, so there's still, I think, a hesitancy and a reluctance amongst many prescribing doctors to give an adequate amount of the substitute drug, which people need to remove them uh, from an environment where they need to go and uh, secure illicit drugs just to stay uh, sane and comfortable, as it were. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a related question from Natalie, um, who asks about a news item today that the Scottish police will be ca carrying mm. nal nal naloxone, um, I hope that's how you yeah. pronounce it, uh, the opioid blocking um, drug. Do you think that's a positive step towards policy reform? Oh, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. I'd forgotten about that. But yeah, that's a really a uh, welcome bit of good news today, isn't it? That um, that's going to be rolled out across Scotland. And, um, you know, I think that's something we'd like to see replicated um, in the other parts of the country as well, in Northern Ireland, Wales and England. Um, you know, for those that don't know, naloxone um, is a drug that is able to reverse the effects of a potentially fatal overdose from an opiate. Uh, so it can be given by anyone um, requires very minimal amount of training and understanding. Um, and of course, police, uh, the police are often first on the scene when someone is overdosed. So it's really critical that they do carry it um, and feel confident again enough to administer it and save lives. Um, I've already mentioned, you know, we, we have to be doing things like this because we've got the, um, you know, we lead the way in Europe in, in terms of uh, having drug related deaths. We have the highest on record, keep adding to those year on year. So um, naloxone um, on its own won't um, completely solve this, but it is one part of the solution to reducing the record number of people dying. Um, and, and these people are dying in their 40s. You know, they're dying. The last time people routinely died in the 40s was when we had Queen Victoria on the throne. You know, mm. so they're dying decades before they should. Mm. And, you know, what really irritates me about this is the government quite often uh, justifies or writes off these record number of drug related deaths um, as a result of an aging cohort of drug users. I mean, we, we don't say that about any other uh, group of people with health problems. We don't um, say that, you know, people with heart disease are dying because they're aging um, or due to, you know, it being their own fault or whatever, you know, but somehow it's OK. Um, to do that with this particular group and of course the impact it has on those communities for every single person that dies um, you know they often leave a family friends um, uh, and a whole community behind and the impact it has on them as well so yeah no, anything that can be done um, you know including the the news today around naloxone is fantastic news yeah great well, I know the questioner agrees with you and is, um, according to the Q&A, nodding vigorously here. You'll be glad to, you'll be glad All to. right. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> Just, you know, if we were in a room, you'd be able to see that, but you can't yeah. see that. So there you go. <laughs> um, there's, there's a number of questions that I don't know how to summarise into, into one or two, but um, there's a few questions about um, the parts of your talk that focus on gender and on race. Um I don't know whether, um, yeah, I think the, um, the the gendered nature, first of all, um, how how much do we know, and perhaps more, more, more specifically, how much do we not know about um, drug treatment effectiveness and the routes into using drugs for, um, between between men and women? <laughs> how, how partial is this evidence base? I'm actually just reading that Invisible Women book at the moment, so that was on that yeah. was on my questions too. So thanks to who, whoever that attendee was for um, asking a question that's um, right at the top of my list too. Uh, thanks for mentioning that book because it's fantastic, and of course that covers a range of um, health problems. Yeah, it's good to give it a plug, um, and particularly prior to Christmas, Karen, it should be in everyone's stocking. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, in terms of 
uh, gender, it's pretty systemic, really. I mean, I was focusing on, um, I think, on uh, female drug deaths, but of course, it has an impact on treatment because most of, well, let, let me backpedal a little bit. It, you know, one of the problems with research is that, you know, it can be difficult to recruit people into research. So, of course, what happens in addiction research is people, researchers go into the treatment setting to recruit people. But of course, those treatment settings are dominated by men, um, you know, something in the region of seven to one. Uh, so, of course, what that means is our understanding around treatment is, again, based on what happens to men in treatment rather than what happens to women. It, it, it may be yeah. that the outcomes are the same, but we just don't know. And mm. I, I would be, I, I have enough of a hunch to believe they would be different because uh, we just think about practical things like childcare. Um, the, the fact that most uh, women who develop problems with drugs have experienced intimate partner violence, and yet we're asking them to go to clinics uh, where the perpetrators of that violence are sitting in the waiting room. So it's no wonder women are putting off, uh, put off rather going into treatment. So I think, you know, there's lots of little practical things. There are little, but they could have a huge impact. But the problem goes beyond that. Um, it isn't just about um, the research that's carried out. It's about who's doing the research. So from top to bottom, we still have a male dominated field. And I think addiction is probably no different. Karen will put me right on this. Uh, to other areas of health but you know the yeah we we do have an equal number of uh, junior male and female uh, researchers in addiction by and large but as careers progress that that kind of gatekeeping goes on um, where it's men who are the journal editors the grant givers or the grant gatekeepers so we have a systemic problem and you know to their credit the leading journal for addiction, rather cunningly called the Journal of Addiction, um, included this in their editorial two or three years ago and pointed to the fact that it isn't just about um, male bias research, it's also about the, um, the systemic nature of uh, male dominance in the research field. So I think both need to be addressed. And you can't address one without the other. And I'm sure that's even... Yeah, sorry, I think there's a small delay on my on my line just now, but I'm sure um, I'm sure that's even more the case when we look at um, racial differences between, yeah. um, you know, race and and academia. There are sort of yeah. inherent um, systemic problems there, too, which perhaps aren't doing anything to address some of the misperceptions around around race and drugs. Well, that's a really good point, Karen. And the thing is, I, I don't know about other fields. But in the field of addiction, we need the best brains. So the idea of excluding a key group, i.e. women, from um, you know, generating ideas, from carrying out the research, is, is nothing short of criminal. OK. Um, I had, um, we probably should, should, should be wrapping up um, just now. But I, I, let, let's go for another two quick ones, if that's OK. Um, one of our one of our questioners asked, "Whose work has particular have you found particularly useful in your research, and whose work have you found inspiring?" So, yeah, give us a little a little key key text that we should be reading or putting in our Christmas stockings. Um, the, you know, it's a bit cheesy, isn't it? But I guess it's also I'm, um, I can't tell who's here watching, so I have to be very careful. Um, but you know, I, I've been really lucky to work with. A range of people, you know, Mark Monaghan, Alex Stevens, a, a range of people, really, Harry Sumnall and others, um, Sharon Cox, a, a whole load of people. But I think the paper that really has had the biggest impact was one in 2010 by uh, Doug Sellerman. Um, and it, it's a great read. It's a very accessible read. And the title of it is uh, The Ten Most Important Things Known About Addiction. And essentially what that does, as the title uh, suggests, is uh, hopefully, as I've done, is point to what we don't know rather than what we do know. Um, and it's almost like a research wish list of, of what needs to be focused on and the priority for the field of addiction. Um, and although it's written in 2010, you could read it in 2020 and it would be just as fresh 
um, as it was 10 years ago. So that, that's my, um, that's the one that springs to mind. That's great. We'll all be we'll all be googling that right now. Um, and the final question um, for for this evening. And again, apologies to all the people um, whose whose questions I haven't got got to. But there was one question about the um, the effects of the COVID pandemic on on drug use. Um, you, mm. you you touched on alcohol use, but but how much has impact has COVID had on on drug use in the population? Yeah, so we, we seem to have more survey data on alcohol than drugs. So that's the first thing to say that there has been some small survey data from an organization called Release um, and another one called Crew, which are based in Scotland. And that, that seems to suggest, unsurprisingly, that party drugs aren't quite as popular as they used to be, obviously, because you've um, unless you're partying with others in your house, there isn't really a party to go to. Um, but I think for me, rather than, there's not really a lot I can say about drug use in COVID because I think we've still got to find that out. Well, what I can say is how resilient drug dealing has been. So the supply and distribution chain, um, you know, right from uh, the origins of uh, and manufacture of drugs through to the end point has proved to be remarkably resilient. Um, so although you might have expected with all the um, lockdown issues and restricted movement to see uh, problems uh, getting hold of drugs that doesn't seem to have happened so it just shows how um, ingenious flexible and resilient the the the, um, the whole kind of supply and distribution network is despite the war on drugs and despite prohibition um, they've proved yet again that they can cope with things like the covid pandemic Fascinating. Um, okay, well, I think we're, we're already um, way over time, but it was such a such an interesting talk, such an such an interesting discussion as well. So, so can I first of all thank you, Ian, for a really fascinating um, talk and for and for really engaging fabulously with the with the discussion. And can I also thank um, all of the people? Um, I wish I could see you all um, and and say hi, but everybody um, that that's listening in and everyone that um, put all the terrific questions in the Q&A box. Um, again, sorry for not having time to answer all of them. Um, just before we finish, um, I'd like to remind you of the two other lectures in the Wellbeing series. There were lectures earlier this term on sleep and on perfectionism, and they're both available to view on the York Ideas YouTube page. So um, do take a look at those. They were great. Um, so yeah, finally, thank you, Ian. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thanks, Karen.